Good evening, brothers and sisters, family and friends, and we're continuing with the uh, Life of Christ uh, series tonight, and the lesson will be Jesus Cast Out Demons. And the main scripture is going to be from Luke 8, 26 through 40. Uh, we'll probably just read through 39. Uh, next slide. So it reads, then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes and he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him to let them enter there. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. The people went out to see what happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Now, this country of the Gerasenes, which you'll see in the map here, is, as it says, opposite Galilee on the west side of the Jordan. And it was pretty much uh, a Gentile country, right? Mostly Gentiles lived there. And we know that Jesus mostly operated in his time here uh, in Jewish territory. So it's interesting that Jesus seems to specifically go there, right? He went there purposely. It wasn't an accident. He got in the boat and went purposely to uh, this land of the Gerasenes, right? Purposely to see this man, I believe, purposely to heal him. Now, the man had demons. So, you know, tonight we're going to get into talking a little bit about demons. You don't have time to go into a full in-depth study on, you know, demons and angels and that kind of thing. Uh, there's just a few things I would like to discuss. Um, can I get the next slide? Uh, Right, so there's the map. And then uh, next slide. So one of the things I want to discuss is what are demons, right? What Basically, what do we know about them? Now, you know, some of us may have some ideas of what we think they are from what Hollywood tries to picture or things we may have read in books or Greek mythology. But, you know, we want to make sure that we get our understanding of, of demons from what the scriptures say. Um, so one of the things is the word demon actually is the word Dami Onian, if I'm pronouncing it right, the Greek word, which really just means evil beings, right? Um, and it comes from another word, daemon, which just means knowing or, or intelligence. Uh, basically, they're spirits, right? Uh, that's what it says in Matthew 8, 16, that, you know, that evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, right? And Jesus cast out the spirits. So we know they were not physical. They didn't have physical bodies, right? They were spiritual now, they also were intelligent, right? They could hear, they could speak, they could think, they could feel, and they could act, right? In Mark 1, 24, you see they're having a conversation with Jesus, asking him, what do you have to do with us? Are you going to destroy us? So they seem concerned about that, right? They knew who he was. And even in the passage we just read in Luke, there's a conversation back and forth with Jesus. And, and Matthew's version says kind of like the same thing. Are you here to torment us? Right, which... Uh, we see in the next uh, example, they're wicked and ultimately they're to face judgment, right? Matthew 8, 29 says, and behold, they cried out, what have you to do with us, O son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? 
So that scripture makes it clear that demons have a appointed time to face judgment, uh, eternal judgment, where they're going to suffer and be tormented, right, for all eternity. And they know that. And they're aware of that, right? Um, the other thing we know about them is they are extremely hostile to human beings. Uh, they oppress men and women. They cause disease like blindness, muteness, they deaf. Uh, they can cause madness, right? There's a bunch of scriptural references you'll see. Uh, even this man uh, that we read about that was demon-possessed, right? It may seem like, oh, wow, but he had superhuman strength. Uh, but the superhuman strength does not seem to be there for his benefit, right? It seemed to have been there so that they can just cause him more anguish and more pain because he didn't have any clothes on. So it allowed him somehow he was able to withstand extreme temperatures, right, of hot and cold. Uh, he would be bound and able to break the chains. So it just seemed like the superhuman strength was just given to him so that the demons could torment him more, not necessarily for his benefit, right? Um, we know that Satan is their master, right? In Matthew 12, 26, right, Jesus, in response to the Pharisees who accused him of driving out the demons by the prince of demons, right, he told them, well, if Satan cast out Satan, so Jesus made it clear that those, de those demons were with Satan, the demons that possessed people, right, Part of probably the same, right, angels that had been cast out with Satan from heaven. Uh, we know that they're subject to the authority of Jesus, right? In Luke 10, 17, it says, the 72 return with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subjects to us in your name. So by the name and power of Jesus Christ, the demons had to submit themselves, right? Uh, in this passage that we read in Luke 8, in verse 28 through 32, you see that they ask, they beg Jesus, right? Please, they ask him permission. Please send us into the pigs. And it says he gave them permission. So they were, Jesus was not their master, but Jesus had mastery over them, right? Jesus was the master, right? Lord of all, right? And they had to subject themselves to him. Now, where do they come from? Uh, that's a good question. They come from the abyss, right? In Luke 8, 31, it says, and they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the question is, well, what is the abyss? Oh, the Greek word for abyss is the busos, a bottomless pit, the deep, right? It's an underground chasm, a spiritual underground chasm, right? Where evil demonic beings are in prison and from which the beast arises. We see this, these references in Revelation, which teaches us this. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 1 through 3 says, And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who was the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So you see, this is, and the other two uh, scriptures basically reference similar language. It's the bottomless pit, all right, is, is where you're sealed and they cannot get out, right, unless they're let out. That, that is the abyss. Next scripture, maybe next slide. So another thing I like to talk about is, which we may be thinking about also, right? We read the scripture and others about demon possessions. Why was there demon possession? Right? Why did God allow demon possession? And I want to answer that question with another question, which I think answers that question, which is why did Christ cast out demons? Right? Because if there was demon possession, well, Christ was there to cast them out. So why was this? In John 9, 1, I think it gives us the answer. It says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. So you see, it wasn't that demon possession was necessary because of the work of the demons, right? It seemed to be allowed so that Christ could remove them. Just like in this case, this man was blind from birth, not because he did anything wrong for any particular reason, but when Jesus healed him, it was clearly shown that the healing came from God, that it was the work of God. And we know that is part of the reason why Jesus came for our salvation, but also to heal people of their sicknesses, their diseases, their illnesses. And one of them was to be have demons cast out of them, right? When they were possessed by demons. So, so basically the reason is 
so that I could be clearly seen that it's God who's working to cast them out, right? That's part of God's work. What's another reason? In Luke 7, 20 through 22, it says, And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases, plagues, evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. So basically, Christ cast out demons to show who he was, that he was the Christ, that he was the one that they were looking for. Remember, people kept asking, well, who, who is he? Who are you? Well, this clearly showed if he's able to do this type of work, then clearly he must be Emmanuel. He must be God with us. He is the Christ, the son of the living God. And his ability to cast out demons proved that. What's another reason? John 2.23 now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Now, we know that signs were necessary uh, to go along with the message, right, that Christ was preaching when he went along. If there were no signs, people would not have believed who he was. They would not have believed in him. So at that time, right, we know that it was necessary to have signs. So when people saw that, wow, he can cast out demons, he can heal people, right? They believed in him. So it was necessary for him to also be able to cast out demons, right? So that people would believe. Uh, lastly, Luke 8.39 says, and this is part of the ending conversation that Jesus is having with the man whom he, uh, in Gerasenes, whom he cast the demons out from. And the man wants to go with them, right? He's healed. He's seeing in his right mind. He He's like, Jesus, I want to go with you. And Jesus basically says to him, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. So last reason I have here is, you know, why did Christ cast out demons? Is so that the good news could be spread, right? When you were healed of a sickness or illness, what did it cause you to want to do? Go out and tell everybody else about it. So imagine if Jesus had just gone to this land, which by, again, is a Gentile land, and told them who he was and just leaves, and doesn't do any, perform any signs. Well, there would be no good news, really, to go and share, right? What would be the point, the purpose? So, again, Jesus went there specifically to cast out his demons so that this man can go and tell everybody what had been done with him, and good news could be spread, right? Um, next slide. So another big thing we may think about, which I wanted to discuss quickly is, is there still demon possession today, right? Now, again, I, like I said, we have, you know, movies that show us things, right? Books, all kinds of stuff. And some people say yes, but the short answer without getting into too much is no, right? What we see in the New Testament, what we read in those scriptures is not happening today, right? The age of miracles has ceased right? And so has demon possession. Remember the reason, the purpose for demon possession. And we saw it really during the time of Christ so that Christ could remove the demon. So with that time ended, there's no more demon possession. And think about it, if there was, because the apostles and Christ were the only ones who could heal them, who would be around to heal people of demon possession? Nobody. And look, sometimes people may say things like, well, I think there is, or what about things like um, mental illnesses? Remember, think about what we've read in the scriptures about demon possession. They gave people superhuman strength. I mean, have you seen that would equate today to somebody who is possessed by a demon and you can't imprison them. They break out the bars and break out the jail. You couldn't taser them. You couldn't shoot them, right? There would be no way to stop this person. Well, in today's world, that would be all over social media. So if anybody has heard or seen something like that, let me know. I have not. Uh, the other thing was that demon possession was clearly seen by people. They, there were people who were afflicted with disease that was not demon caused by demons. And there were people afflicted that was, and it was clearly able to be seen the difference. They caused blindness, muteness. They made people mad. They made them sick. And when Jesus healed them, he didn't just cast out the demons as with this man. He also healed them of the sickness that the demon had caused. So like I said, we don't see this. Uh, today, right? And I just gave that reference of 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, as a reference to the fact that this age of, of miracles has passed, and um, now we have the word of God. There's, there's no longer any need for that. 
However, there is still demonic activity, right? James acknowledges this in James 2.19 when he says, right, you believe God is one, you do well. Well, even the demons believe. So he was acknowledging, yes, demons are still around. But what are they doing? Are they still, you know, they're not possessing people like that. So what are they doing? Well, 1 Timothy 4 verses 1 through 3 gives us an idea. It says, now the spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves. Oops, I didn't finish reading the scripture. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go back. Uh, one scripture. There we go. Sorry about that. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forget, forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So this scripture makes it clear that demonic activity now has to do with false teaching, right? Uh, teaching to turn people away from the truth, right? Because right now it's the word of God we're trying to get out there. And so what's going to be, Satan's going to be against that. He's going to be against the truth through false teaching. And it can be clearly seen what type of false teaching. Well, some examples here, when we see teaching about you can't get married or you can't eat certain foods, then we know that demons are being active, right? That's coming from demons. Um, it's not, uh, obviously, it's not coming from God. So we have to be aware of this false teaching. But again, that's how they're active today through teaching false things. Uh, next, last slide. So basically, last thing to talk about is how do we combat this work of demons and Satan today, right? We're not doing, you know, exorcisms or anything like that, right? Uh, but what does Ephesians say? Well, basically, Ephesians is teaching us that we need to put on the armor of God to take our stand against the schemes of the devil, right? The armor of God. It's not flesh and blood we wrestle against, but it's the authorities, the cosmic powers over the present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil, right? Demons and Satan. That's basically it. And how are we going to combat this? Well, with the word of God, right? With the truth, basically. Um, we have the truth, right? We have the word of God. We're in this kingdom. Our eyes have been enlightened. We're no longer in darkness. So by spreading the good news, the gospel, we can basically uh, just, that's how we combat and, and basically put to an end any type of demonic activity today. We need to go out and share the word of God, share the gospel. As we share the gospel and people turn to God, they will be freed, right, from any power that demons may have over them. But it's up to us. Right, brothers and sisters, we got to get that gospel out there. We got to share the truth. Don't hold it to yourself. So if you think that there's any demonic activity going on, share the truth, share the gospel, and you can end it. Amen.